what exactly are the strings made of that were on your base for Prague? If you ask me what exactly, that I don't know it, and only the master knows it, and he would not <laughs> tell you the secrets. <laughs> okay, I got it. Okay. It's, a, it's a top secret. The string is made of top secret. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath. Appreciate so much you tuning in today. And visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for all the details about what's going on here. Send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com or send me a message on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. It all gets to me. I'd love to hear from you. Give me a suggestion for a guest. Let me know what's going on. Do you have an event coming up? I'd love to spread the word. And I know you'll love today's show with Simone Marchignac, who is somebody I've wanted to have on the show for years. Such a great artist, such a warm, personable guy, and we had such a good time talking about what he's up to. And he's up to a lot. I saw him play in Prague, recital, standing room only recital, with Evan Mitchell. He played the Frank Proto Sonata, which was written for Simone and was premiered at the International Society of Basses Convention in Colorado in 2015. And Leiben Music, Frank Proto's company, has released a CD, DVD called New Music for Double Bass and Piano. And this, folks, this is a must-have for any bassist library. Get this, there's a link in the show notes. It's first class in every sense. First of all, the recording rocks. There's a CD and there's a DVD. The CD is amazing. It features the Dubignon Sonata, the Proto Third Sonata, Lu Shang's Fantasy for bass and piano, and the Ultimate Workout by Meierling. So we'll feature excerpts from the Ultimate Workout, the Proto, and the Lu Shang. So the CD is amazing, but the DVD adds that next level. It's beautiful, beautifully filmed. And Simone and I talk about the whole process. And in addition to the performance, it has interviews with everybody involved. Simone, Evan, both of them together in an interview, Frank Proto, Richard Dubignon, and Lu Shang. Wow, it's amazing. The first movement of the Proto from the DVD is also on YouTube. So be sure to check that out and see how it was filmed. Uh, There's a link to that in the show notes as well. And thank you, Diderio, for sponsoring Contrabass Conversations. And I'd love to let you know a little bit about their Zyx strings, which are multi-filament synthetic core. They have a rich, colorful, gut-like tone. You can get them in medium and light tension. You can get them with a C extension. Barry Bales, Missy Raines, Chris Jennings, Yuri Slavic, Tim Surratt, all use them. They're made in America it designed, engineered, and crafted the D'Addario String Factory in New York. So check them out, and thank you, D'Addario, for sponsoring the podcast. All right, here we go with our conversation with Simone Marchignac. <laughs> Watch the two interviews on the DVD that you've got. So you got the one with um, with Dirk Fisher. Is that the name of the person? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. Ca- Carmen De Leone. I know Carmen. Uh, he. I used oh. to play in an orchestra he conducted. Uh, and. <laughs> At the Ballet of Cincinnati, is that right? Well, that's his, been his gig for a long time, but he also was the conductor of the Illinois Philharmonic, which is just this regional oh. orchestra south of Chicago. So I would go down there and, and play every once in a while. So I haven't, I haven't seen him in years. Oh, wow. It's a small word, you see, because he seems, I mean, he's, I, I think apparently he's a good friend of Frank. Yeah. Frank asked him to do this interview for us. Uh, we did it just at the, like at the very end after the last session. Mm-hmm. So it was just like one hour to do it. So yeah, that, that's the only time I have actually met him. But he was really nice. You know, he uh, he was actually a great interviewer too. The way he approached it, you know, interesting questions and yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it was nice. It's a it's a quite a, it's a wonderful DVD. I mean, I, I have the audio CD too, which I already pulled in so I can use some excerpts, but like, I love that, you know, the camera, obviously you're, the playing's great, you know, it's a great, and I love that, that 
that piece, um, what is that last that like you never stop playing 16th notes, the ultimate workout? That's, uh, well, that, that's the uh, ultimate workout of Hill Meiering. And as a matter of fact, I'm in a city where he lives too. You know, I'm in Amsterdam and he lives here. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that thing is, is wild. That's, a, that's quite, a, quite a piece. And, and I love the camera angles and everything that they've got. I mean, you've got, I don't know how many cameras were set up, but it's really cool footage. Well, there, there was the whole crew yeah. that, I mean, I have to say, first of all, that everything for this project was organized by Frank. And okay. he was like, I say, he was the father of that project from beginning to the end. And we will never have done it without him. And the main, uh, let's say, reason or the, or, or the motivation to do this, of course, was started by his sonata. Yeah. And then I think because he did this kind of projects in the past or either CDs or even DVDs, but all of those projects were just featuring only his music, of course, because it's his label. Mm -hmm. And he's also, you know, publishing, financing all of that himself. But this time it seemed that maybe there was not enough works that would be unheard and still, you know, not recorded a, a lot of times already or a few times. Yeah. So that's why we're, we we added those other pieces just because they were fresh and new, and uh, we just set this this workout uh, piece as this kind of encore. Uh, it's only also first movement because the piece actually has two movements. <laughs> is the second movement as crazy as the first? <laughs> it's a bit calmer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very different. It's it's more put of pieces together, but seems, it seems to form a bow uh, like a long line. Uh, starts and finishes in the same way. Uh, very different in character, actually. I mean, there are bits like in first movement, but there are much slower bits too. And I, you know, I've been playing this piece uh, quite a few times before recording this piece. But for this recording, it seemed like like nice idea to just have this as an en encore, like almost separate from the rest of the program. Cool. The process of recording was just like any uh, audio CD recording. But of course, we were dressed, and we had the whole camera filming crew that that also Frank organized. And I don't, I don't know how many of these guys were, and there were like four or five of them um, filming from different angles and sides, and that's how you get all those shots uh, from, from sometimes from a side or from, from, from the top. And all of that, of course, at the end was we first did the, the audio editing, mm -hmm. like for the, for the audio CD. As a matter of fact, of course, there is an audio CD uh, with the yeah. same performance. And then all of that was done by Frank. And later he did the whole filming uh, editing. So to just actually syn synchronizing and adjusting the picture to the sound, which uh, he was telling us this is going to take a long time after we've done the audio editing. So it, it, I think it was uh, tons of work for him. And uh, also the choice of uh, all materials. I don't know if you've seen everything of, of interviews of the features that are there because there's interviews with every composer and all the choices of pieces that are running in the background as the music, the pictures, the um, all, all material that is there, the graphic, of course, of the, it's all Frank's work. So, it, you know, we just came <laughs> and we recorded the, the musical material. So <laughs> it seems like our work is very small. Man, wow, that's, that's, a, that's remarkable. It's, it, I, no, I haven't seen all the features. I, I watched just a, just a couple of the extras, but like there, it made me think, man, I wish I could do that for my podcast. You know, because it's great. Like you're, it's very well produced video. And then there are all these uh, uh, slides or like images of you at different periods of your life. And it's very, just a wonderful production overall. I can't even imagine the amount of post-production work that must have that must have taken. Well, how well? So, how did you or did you commission or did he write that third sonata for you? How did that sonata come into being? Well, I first I first met Frank uh, personally at the uh, ISB convention in Rochester, New York, in 2013. I was very honored, actually, because that was my very first visit to any ISB conventions in the United States. And uh, so I didn't know Madeline Crouch. I didn't know anybody at, uh, at uh, ISB, in fact. Um, I've been to some European conventions, so there have been some people from America, and uh, so I sent my stuff to Christine Corp, that was president at the time, and um, at some point there was a situation occurring that, um, I think it was Bojo Paradzik, 
who cancelled his recital uh, that was going to be on the main stage, so as uh, like an evening's headliner. Um, because I think that my recital original was put on one of many recitals during the day. And then it was, in fact, very generous of Nicholas Walker, who I, who I met a few years before that. He, he basically recommended and said some very nice things about me uh, to, to Madeline, apparently. And so I was allowed to take over that cancelled recital of uh, Bojo Paradzic, and that became my recital. So as a matter of fact, I came my first visit on any ISB conventions, and I was uh, already playing on the main stage. It was really great. But before it happened, of course, I wrote to Frank and told him, because I, I programmed um, his piece Nine Variants on Paganini that I've played uh, already one or two years before. It was still a pretty fresh thing for me. And that's how we met. He came backstage and he was lovely. He was very nice. And uh, uh, we talked and I, I was thinking like, I, because I've played some pieces of his before, uh, like we, we all did, you know, uh, yeah. I was inspired. And uh, I'd never even thought about meeting him someday in person. So, um, and afterwards, the next time we met was in, uh, in the, at the TCU um, International Best Festival uh, organized by Professor Liu mm -hmm. in uh, Fort Worth, where he teaches, uh, the Christian, Texas Christian University, where I had my recital, and that's where I met Frank for the second time. And then I sort of started talking to him about um, maybe writing some piece, but that was very... That was very vague. I didn't actually think that, I mean, I wasn't sure if it ever happened. And um, I, I was thinking if it ever happens, probably it will take many, many years because he's so busy and he's so much in demand. And, but nevertheless, uh, beginning of 2015, it was clear that he is in fact going to write this piece and I will just perform it at the... At that, this ISB Colorado convention, I didn't know in the beginning what it's going to be. Is it going to be sonata? Is it going to be very long piece? Or is it going to be small piece? I was already thrilled just by the fact that, wow, I will have a piece from Frank Proto, who yeah. wrote just tons of bass repertoire. And, um, uh, well, I mean, you heard the piece, uh, I guess, in the DVD and live and uh, in Prague recently. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention that, in fact, at that TCU bass festival, uh, in, which was 2014, that was also where I first met Evan Mitchell, the oh, pianist. Okay. Played together, and uh, well, thanks to Mr. Professor Lu, who invited me there, uh, because I, I, didn't, I could not take any pianist from Europe, that was obvious, and he just said, I've got you a great pianist here to, to be your accompanist for your recital. I had a difficult program because we played the workout of Meiring, entire piece. We played Nine Variants on Paganini, we played the Herpless Sonata. Difficult program for which you need really uh, excellent pianists and uh, I wasn't sure, you know, because when you go to this bass events it can go like this or like that and if you, if you, if you choose a very complex program um, it, it's always a question if you, if you get it done the way you like. Right, yeah, of course. What you have to face is that some pieces are so much of, of duet that it can't be done or it cannot be done with any accompanist, not just because the because, uh, quality of, of the pianist, but just because it must be a duet. And in this very quick sort of rehearsal situation, it's impossible to do sometimes. Yeah. But with Evan, it was just so easy. It was just so great. It was so easy. So then the next time well, there was an opportunity, he never played actually at any ISB conventions before, but um, uh, we tried to get him there with Madeline and it worked and that was the next opportunity and then so the, the recording emerged from that.
the third sonata, the, yeah, the proto sonata, epic is the word I would use to describe it. It's an amazing piece, not an easy piece by any stretch of the imagination. And yeah, even if you had an amazing collaborative pianist, accompanist, it's not an accompanimental part. It's a duet, just like you said. So you performed it at ISB 2015, right? That's where you played it? Yeah, that was, that was the world premiere. Okay. And as a matter of fact, I didn't really perform it live, except, of course, we did the recording until now, until Prague, to, based 2016. Just because the recording happened very soon. In fact, we did this recording, uh, when was that? That was in July of 2015. And the convention, the Colorado convention, was just one, one month before that. So that was very fresh. In a way, we wanted it that way, just to keep it fresh. And now it's new, so let's just you know, keep your hand on the pulse. And we managed to do this recording. So afterwards, when I had the material of recording, I was just thinking, if I ever do it again, at least next time must be with Evan. No one else, because the recording, especially, is going to be, be released. And we've reached that sort of dialogue that um, it's not easy to reproduce it with someone else. So I just didn't see the point of doing it. And so, but that, that's why I'm so happy that Evan actually came to Prague and uh, that uh, you know people from base Europe were willing to invite him from that far away. And uh, that uh, made it possible for us to play together again and do this program. It was great. And, and folks, the performance was packed. It was like a standing room only in this and just such a it was such a tight performance. Like I remember there were all these like unison or these rhythmic unison passages. I was trying to figure out like what pulse this was in. And you're just like, boom, boom, like r- nailing every single one of those is just you had this really cool. Is it the last note of the last movement or something? But this, it ends in a very sort of like playful way. Well, there's, there's, there's a couple couple moments like that. Yeah. You know, I, I actually said one thing to Frank when we saw each other in Prague now. I say to Frank, you know what the worst thing is about your sonata? <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing is that I cannot practice it on my own. Yeah. Which is a very bad thing to say because you actually have to learn these notes. From a technical standpoint of view, I have to say, if you played very difficult pieces of Frank or other bass repertoire, it's not uh, the sort of virtuoso, flashy type of piece at all. It's not only about playing fast. Uh, the thing is that the difficulty about playing this practice on your own is that it feels like it's music in pieces. And it only makes complete sense when it's played with the pianist. And that's, that's the, the example when we're talking about those pieces that are so much of a duet that they actually only make sense when they when they are played together. It's, it's just impossible to to. That, that's why that's why it's not easy to work on it. Like to to play it on your own and have a feeling that uh, you are making some musical lines. Even even all the pizzicato bits when I'm doubling mostly the left hand of the piano, you don't even hear the complete rhythm because it's always filling in one voice of piano, a bit of the bass, and so on and so on. Man, the other thing that that struck me, so you're, the, at the end, that final recital at, at Bass 2016, you played with three other bass players. You played the, uh, the proto quartet for basses. And anybody listening, I don't know if anybody out there has worked on it. I hope you have if people are listening. But I was in a bass quartet and we were working on that piece and just banging our head against the wall for so long trying to get those rhythms together and all that. And you guys threw that together in what, a couple of hours? Well, yeah, you say so. Although, although you know, I this the whole thing started in in this way. I had an idea to invite Frank, mm-hmm. uh, which for me was the chance, first of all, to have Evan and uh, play that program, uh, including his sonata, and that was in fact my main motivation to 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 attend the convention to have this kind of project. Plus, of course, I knew that Frank's 75th birthday is just in this year, in a year when there is no ISB convention in the United States. So I thought, okay, how about if we would try and honor Frank in, in a very unusual place for him, because it's in Europe, he's in Prague, but maybe he, he would like to come. So besides the performance with Evan, my idea was how about program his bass quartet, but without putting in a, in a program just as a surprise. Uh, and my original idea was actually to do it in my recital, but later I found out it's middle of the day and it's a very small room. And then I was talking to Ursula Pedersen from um, from Base Europe, um, and she said that they haven't got a lot of material for uh, for a final concert still. 
and it's in a big hole. So I thought, okay, let's risk it, do it, do it there. And uh, of course, we met to rehearse the quartet for one day only at uh, the Prague Convention. But the idea was earlier, and I actually, I studied the piece. I mean, I, I had the recording previously and the music because I ordered from Frank several years ago from his company before we knew each other even. And uh, I always wanted to play this piece, but I thought, where's the group to do it? Yeah. And finally now I thought, maybe that's, that's the occasion. So at first I had a look actually who is there at the convention, because you know that the piece is very complex I mean, first of all, difficult to put together rhythmically, uh, but also stylistically. Yeah, no kidding. I, I was thinking, who could I ask? Because if I want to offer a present to Frank, that, that must be kind of good, you know? <laughs> and um, so I knew it, it must be classical players, obviously, it must be guys who have some experience in playing quartet. And I, I, you know, I was really happy that they all agreed. Alberto Boccini played second base and uh, Volkan Oron the third base and Simon Garcia fourth base. And they are all just totally in the world of chamber music and bass quartets and other ensembles. And Simon is, is writing a lot of stuff for different ensembles. Uh, Alberto is the bass gang and Volkan also did a lot of quartet stuff. So I knew that with these guys, it's going to go well. The thing I wasn't sure about, of course, is with this, of this level of difficulty and with this very quick um, rehearsal time, is it going to fly? And the, the good thing was that because it's a surprise and it was never on the program, I, I didn't have this pressure that like we have to play. I would always say, well we don't do this because it's not good enough. But um, that I, I sent the stuff, I sent the score, I sent the parts, and I sent Frank's own recording that is actually overdubbed. He recorded all voices. And uh, I think actually when Frank plays his own music, he has a very special uh, type of sound and phrasing on the bass. His improvisations also, uh, both Pizzicato and Arco, are, uh, I think he found his own language. And no one, no one sounds like him. When he plays bass, so anytime I, I hear any recording of his pieces played by him, uh, it tells me very much about the music. So for me, it was very clear. So I would just look at the part and was imagining like who could play this or or that. So I sent it to the guys and I said, "Look, uh, I'm free if you want to do this. It's just that we should." prepare on our own a little bit. Right. <laughs> Just to mention that it won't be possible if we come to rehearsal without knowing this piece at all. But they really put their heart into it. And I'm, I'm really grateful to them that um, they really engaged and uh, we, we could actually do it. I still, I still find it weird that actually it, it went so well in this very short time. <laughs> it was it was great. I mean, I was I was you know it's, it's four great players, but just having spent so much time with that piece myself, and we're like you know nodding our heads trying to keep the rhythm straight because just rhythmically it's so complex uh, and in so many spots. Well, you know, like first race, I looked like you know I was I was actually yelling one, two, <laughs> three, four. Because I know that I knew that our time was limited, and um, um, you know, I, I made I, I really I did a lot of studies with with the score, and um, you know, not everything was perfectly together in performance too. Like I I got this recording, Volkan actually recorded this on camera, uh, like from from a side of the audience, and uh, so, but I think somehow we were all in the right mood also this, this you know we, we also did a very good work in this one day um but there are just some some bits that are very very difficult in this piece you know i was in the audience listening to this jaw open you know <laughs> just knowing knowing what you're doing and i noticed and, and this is something that many people are talking about at base 2016 but the quality of sound that you get your bass and those strings and just you as a player obviously but the, it just really is this special kind of soaring sound i hear that on the recording too on the on the cd on the dvd i'd love to know a little bit about your your bass and then maybe we can dig into your the gensler strings uh but 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 what t tell me about your bass well, the bass is Kenwal from 1945, and it's my dear, dear, dear baby, and I'm very happy with the bass. Although, when I first bought it, uh, which now I think was really kind of a lottery win, because it very rarely happens that someone would have 
an original can wow for sale. And, you know, I, I, I cannot prove that this is for sure original, but there is a paper inside and it seems that everything is right. It would be one of his late ones because I think that he, most of them he made in 1920s, 1930s, like the one of Francois is 1936, I think. So this one, 1945. So in the beginning, I asked, myself like is everything original in it and some some luthiers a, a couple of them actually said that the neck was replaced which you can actually see uh, just the neck not scroll but the neck but at some point i worked on that base and it, it just didn't matter if this is 100 or 80 percent whatever original in the beginning it wasn't easy because it actually i could hear that it had the potential and that kind of sound that I knew from Francois, because not so long before that I got very, I very much got inspired by Francois Rabat's playing. I was interested about his bass and what is that, because I didn't know that much of basses before. So then I found out there was this French Lutier, and uh, I found out that there were a few of these basses actually existing, like originals. So I felt so lucky to, at the same time that I actually found one. But in the beginning, it was very mute, the instrument, uh, it seemed to vibrate, which is maybe typical of Kenwal, only with the heights of, of high frequencies. It didn't have a lot of depth, which didn't make the sound really completely full. Um, so, I, so I worked on that, on that and the, the strings of Gerald Gensler, my very good friend, uh, are of course very, very important part of that, but we changed several things over the years and um, well it took a few years to actually develop the sound of it now when did you start experimenting with uh, Gensler's strings or when did you start using his strings the thing about uh, strings of Gerald is um, absolutely linked to the bass in fact Okay. because uh, pr maybe uh, I don't know how things would go if but maybe if it wouldn't be that bass I would uh, not get um, to Gerald's strings at least not at the time um, because I quickly discovered this bass does not work uh, on, say, traditional brand strings, like I had some Tomastics or Pirastro on it. It felt very mute. It felt like it doesn't breathe. And it sounded very narrow, very... There were some overtones, but they were muted. They were... I think that there were a lot of other reasons in the bass at the time for that, but um, my first step was to change strings, and that's how I got to... I, I met Gerald for the first time, and we started to experiment, and we, we just worked on the bass step by step. That was the, the first strings I had from him was the ones I, uh, that he made for Francois Rabat, and later I started using some of his God strings, but made for modern playing. So not the gut string that people associate with baroque playing, uh, not playing gut, but with um, some winding. He used different materials from titan to aluminium, and now it's even iron. So uh, he actually constantly modifies his materials and ideas. And every time, that's actually the best thing about Gerald, is that every time he says that, this is done, this, this is not going to be written anymore, there's nothing more coming. Two weeks later, he's calling, hey, you know what, I, I had <laughs> like a new idea or I found a new material, I want to show you something. So, uh, and this is his whole philosophy. This is his, his, his whole uh, sense of his job and existence because you have to know that actually string, hand string makers, it's some, it's some kind of job that doesn't actually exist. Right. There is no, I, I've, I've never heard about anyone else here in Europe, at least, doing this kind of thing. No, I've never, I've never either. And, and everybody was so fascinated with your, your setup and, and those strings. And I was talking to Gensler about his strings a little bit. Yeah, he's like the, the I mean, this is the best possible way, but he's like the mad scientist of, of bass strings. You know, and what exactly are the strings made of that were on your bass for Prague? Were they synthetic gut wound with iron or what, what were they? Something like that. That that you already answered the question because if you if you ask me what exactly that I don't know it and only the master knows it and he would not <laughs> tell you the secrets. <laughs> okay, I got it. Okay, it's a, it's a top secret. The string is made of top secret. <laughs> um, because you know you don't you don't ask an Italian cooker in some small trattoria in in Italy what exactly he gives to the pasta because he he would never tell you you know. I, I love then, it. Then, then I lose the speciality of it. <laughs> it's the secret sauce. The secret sauce. I love that. That's great. 
<laughs> you know, and even if you find the same materials, I think even uh, I'm pretty sure that even if someone would copy uh, his recipe, uh, the strings w- wouldn't be the same. Like if you get the recipe or or the way you make uh, how to make a Stradivari violin, it won't be made by the master. It, it will still not the sa- sound the same. Yeah. Now, yeah, good point. I think that's that's kind of the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> So you grew up in Poland uh, uh, and piano, then bass, and you got into rock music at some point. Isn't that right? Weren't you like real, wanted to be like a rock and roll star? Oh, yeah, of course I won. nice. <laughs> wanted to. Uh, yeah, when I was when I was a kid. Uh, well, well, I played electric guitar for a while. So um, that was around. I was a little bit into jazz or kind of fusion rock with jazz at, at, at the time when I was 10, 11, until 13. I was starting playing bass at the time. That's right. Um, my father, I mean, in, in, my, um, in, in the house where my parents lived, there was a lot of classical music played, but there was also some progressive rock from mostly 70s, 80s, which I conceive that that, I, that is what I would call the mu- music of my childhood. And of course, I dig this first because that was sort of easy listening. I could yeah. not understand Bach or Haydn when I was five years old, you know, <laughs> maybe it's easier. I, I, I don't know really, but uh, if, if a child comes from a musician's family where, where parents are actually playing professionally, that's maybe different. And my parents were, were very passionate amateur musicians, uh, which they practice then. They don't play now actually anymore, but they used to just practice some, you know, my father played some piano and my mother did some singing and my father even played some very simple kind of flute, but they were not professionals. So, but there was a lot, a lot of music in, in our house played from long place at the time. It was 1980s, still long place before a, before a CD. So yeah, there was, there was quite some progressive rock, some stuff from England, not so much from the States, you know, because there was, there was a big scene actually in um, the former Eastern Europe of rock. Oh yeah, there, there was actually there was a band called Omega. I don't know if you ever heard about them. Uh, I I have I don't think I've heard of Omega, but I remember like even watching some documentaries on like Eastern Europe and like metal and pro- progressive rock and like just what a big scene it was. What what was uh, what was Omega like as a group? Well, they, I mean they, they're from Hungary. I think they're still existing actually, but their best stuff or this sort of best time of them was 1970s 1980s and i i didn't really follow since then i just know some of the music because i remember from my childhood being played and those cities of course came over to poland because anything that was in the eastern bloc was sort of was going around probably also more accessible than any stuff from england or or any western part of europe because we were sort of at the time a bit separated i mean their music was it was like a, a lot of uh, things that were were played in England, I would say, at the time, but with some uh, classical influences too. I think that in, I, I, you know, I wasn't really around at the time, so maybe I'm just, uh, don't know if I'm telling the truth, but I have the impression that in Europe, if anybody went into playing rock, they at least had a bit of classical education first, because that was sort of a very conservative thing in Eastern Europe and also in communistic countries that you need the solid education first to do anything later, you know, anything else than classical music. And most of rock musicians actually did have a bit of education. That's interesting. I never, you know, I've never really thought about that, but I know that classical education or classical music education is more of a foundational thing in Europe, or it has been, uh, than, than the U.S., where you kind of have no expectation that anybody knows anything. That's right. I mean, it's, it's changing now. Also, like many things in Europe changed, and uh, we have European Union now. It's much more unified. But I think still that in some more Eastern European countries, probably the, the whole theoretical 
education, part of, of musical education is much more conservative and solidly based than even in Western countries. how it's evolved I, is really fascinating to me. And I'd, I'd love to dig into that a little bit because I just think you're doing such interesting things in the music world. But here's a question for you. I just popped into my mind, like as to like what you do, like if you were at a dinner party right now and someone says, Simone, what, what do you do? I, what, what would you say? How would you describe your job? Well, I must tell you a story because yesterday we were traveling from Rome back with the Amsterdam Sinfonietta and uh, there was a lady on the plane that didn't belong to our group. And so I was telling her about uh, who we are and what we're doing here and why we're here and so on and so on. And then after all this, she said, and so that's, that's your real job. <laughs> it's like this old musician joke, but actually it still happens. And I said, well, yes, I mean, we paid for that. We're not, we're not amateurs. And she says like, oh yes, of course I understood. <laughs> but it, it's funny that people still, if you, if you tell strangers about being a musician, some of them that don't have this experience uh, or never had it, like they, they cannot imagine, we almost think like they cannot imagine like how can it be that a musician is a profession and they don't do anything else than just playing the instruments. Because a lot of people don't know, like it's not just playing for, for, for myself, it's just playing with other groups. It means a lot of rehearsals, it means a lot of travel means a lot of preparations, means uh, uh, years of practice to that never stop. It's the kind of job that you learn all your life, right? Uh, so, they, they, but the, you say, I'm a musician. Okay, so what do you really do? <laughs> <laughs> you just spending time in your living room playing instrument? Is that a job? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I mean, yeah, good question. I mean, I would say I'm just a musician, you know, I play music. And I found an instrument that I love, and it's my medium. It's, it's not, you know, I don't live for the double bass, um, because my, my passion for music uh, was already my early childhood, because I, b before I knew that I would play double bass ever. I don't know even, it, it sounds maybe strange, but if any day anything happened and I could not play, I would still love music, you know, and I would still maybe try to do something else with it. Yeah. For me, like bass is, I, I'm a musician and bass is one conduit for my musical expression, right? Like I have other way. I, I love, you know, it's, it's interesting because you had a, you had an orchestra job. Uh, you, you were, you were in, weren't you in a principal position? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, what inspired you to leave that job and, and do what you're doing now where you're still playing with groups, but you're also playing solo engagements and doing that. Like what, what prompted that decision? Well, I mean, my time with the, uh, the Hague Philharmonic in uh, the, the residency orchestra of the Hague was, was my first uh, and well, the only really big principal job in the symphony. So it was a very important time for me. Because I got it just when I finished my, my studies, I was just 20. 24, I guess, and I so I spent there six years, and uh, I think it's just different stages in life that come. For me, it was it was very very important experience to actually have this job to get to know a lot of music, orchestra, great music, and uh, work with some great conductors, and um, just spend time and make music with some people that are more experienced than me. And see how how it's like actually to play in the bass section to lead being so young. I think it was it wasn't actually an, an easy experience to start with. I think when I look back now, I didn't think that much about it then. And I think that my 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 dear colleagues had to be very understanding for me. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, because well, at the time, they, most of them they've been there for twenty twenty five years. So much more experience, you know. They knew all the stuff, and I didn't. You know, there, there, there was a time that came that I wanted to do more things outside. And um, that I think that there's always a compromise of being an orchestra musician anyway. Also, 
there was a there was a difficult period for the orchestra at some point, not just for that orchestra, but all orchestras, and all musical or cultural institutions institutions in the Netherlands, uh, because there was a there was a quite a time of of, of crisis uh, in uh, financing uh, the culture. There were some very very destructive decisions made by the Dutch government uh, at the time. Uh, so um, it all sort of made up for for that motivation for me to move on. Also, the feeling that I was I was just finishing my twenties at the at the time, which was sort of a symbolic moment when I thought, okay, if you ever want to try how it's like to be freelance, you should do it now because you probably won't do it when you get to 35 or 40, whatever. That's sort of, if it should be a new kind of start, that's maybe the, the moment, the right moment to do it. I'm happy that I did. You know, that was a very important time, but that was like a next stage for me. How many years ago was that, that you made that move? That was now three years ago. Three years ago, okay, yeah, and 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 from the one of the things with an orchestra job, obviously, is just the rigidity, the the schedule. You're locked into the schedule, and you must have it must have freed you up to do so many. You can't just leave. Like I've had that experience myself. I couldn't. I had a full time job. I couldn't just leave and go to Prague, you know, for a week. But being freelance, you can arrange your schedule to do that. So it must have opened up a, a lot of opportunities that you were able to take advantage of yeah i mean schedule wise that's for sure and I, i'm even thinking like i probably could not go to a lot of those those festivals or base events because they always seem to be placed just around the time that um, people play in orchestra so that's why it's a choice it's a choice and you have to know about it if you if you are um, in, you know, some people managed or there are orchestras that uh, work in a, in, a, in a different way or when you actually do get another free time it's still everything that that it's planned it's very fixed so i mean it's a choice it's a choice and um you just have to be aware about it <laughs> Lot of traveling and as a bass player that means traveling with a bass which is uh not my idea of fun do you have any particularly horrific travel stories <laughs> to, to share well not really i mean there are some difficult situations i mean like the most horrific uh, thing that can happen obviously when your instrument get damaged yeah. and that happily never happened to me like i've never had any serious accident flying uh, well, I have to say, as a very spoiled uh, citizen of Europe, <laughs> a small continent of m many, many uh, possibilities and, and cities to visit and to play, you know, I'm not forced to use planes all the time. And in this area where I move around, when I'm active, uh, which is Germany, Holland, sometimes Switzerland, or occasionally France or some other countries, you can make all those distances by train. Or if you have a car, if you drive, you can drive. I never actually take any this kind of short distance flights with the base on my own. I only flew to to the US uh, ISB conventions or recently this beginning of this year I was in Hong Kong which made like mostly for one travel per year which is um enough for my nerves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that's a good point, though. Also, like the the beauty of a, a small continent with a lot of major cities. Do do you have a removable neck, or are you how how do you get around if you when, on those occasions you do have to fly? No, I mean uh, I I never is installed any removable neck. So I just I, I have one of those light light cases. I think it's made of styrofoam. It's not the lightest one that almost everybody uses. It's a sort of it's called medium which is like, it's actually 50 pounds when it's with a base, everything packed inside. 
That's that's great. So the base it's one of the cases where base goes inside without any cover. Um, so there's only base inside and a couple of just some protecting materials, uh, which uh, fits into the limit of, of every airline, uh, actually. And you just have to check for the sizes with some airlines. It's always a bit of hassle. And it's, it, the most stressful thing is when you pack this, this, this instrument inside and you keep thinking, am I doing this in the right way? Um, but luckily, nothing happened. Bef- when I was flying to my first, uh, my first time, when I flew with the base, in fact, was Rochester Convention. And then the TCU Festival. And those two times, I actually borrowed a case from two different people. At two, those two different times, I uh, borrowed the light Chinese case, but from different people. And even then, uh, nothing happened. Oh, well, that's that's good. Yeah, there's nothing more nerve-wracking than flying. And those little planes are just terrible. Those little. I used to live in a sm- or I'm from a small town, and to bring my base back, I'd have to take one of those real small planes. And I, I never. They never prevented me from taking it on the plane, but it was always high anxiety moments. Um, didn't you play in the base monsters? Did I see that somewhere? I used to play with them. <laughs> How did you get hooked up with them? Did you guys found it together? Were you and Klaus and... Klaus found it. And, uh, well, we, we first actually met uh, again in Rochester. Seems like a good place to meet people. <laughs> <laughs> and so we actually met there. Although I live in Germany and he is from Germany too. So it was kind of funny. We actually spoke for the first time there. And he just invited me to join the band. And I was moving to Berlin at the same time and... I did this for a year and a half, maybe. Was, at the end, unfortunately, I, it was it was a good fun, but I had to give it up because it was uh, too much of a big distance. Like I was based in Berlin, and the other guys were based around Bavaria, Munich, which is almost seven hundred kilometers away. And uh, most of the gigs we played were there, and at some point it was just impossible to travel there and rehearse because at some point we needed new material and play gigs. But for the time. Of, it was just actually in a time when I started my whole freelancing thing and I was looking for new things. So it was fun to be in it for a while. Yeah. For sure. That's cool. I, I have a lot of fun listening to listening to their uh, arrangements. I was just curious about that. I'm I'm wondering about you use the Lavery style end pin, don't you? You like the yeah. the angle. When did you discover that? Well, that came with my, my uh, inspiration with Francois Rabat, of course. It took me a while to install it because I play a, a, a German bow and I was like asking myself, is this actually working with the German bow because it's a different arm angle and everything. And then I talked to Paul Ellison, in fact, and so he actually told me how to put it because I have my end pin is kind of moved to the left a little bit, like to, towards the G-string side. And so the bass is balanced in a little bit different way. I just experimented with it. And I'm still now, I, I've, I've been playing on the same thing for, for more than five years, and I'm still looking for this optimal sort of posture with it. It, it always works differently in different rooms and always works differently when you like everything, when you practice and when you're on stage. <laughs> I think most of it is just because you have such different energy. Yeah. Your, your body changes when, you, when you're in a ne- sort of neutral and adrenaline state, right? Abs- no, it absolutely does. I, I, it, it looks very, it, it, both in your, the recital I saw and then watching the DVD, I mean, it looks very well balanced for you. You look very, very comfortable with it. Did you use a straight pin before that? Yeah, I, I started actually playing standing, yeah, and with straight end pin. I, I've done it many, many years. What were some of the biggest, because I've thought myself about, I haven't experimented with the that style of end pin. I've been using a straight pin, but I also stand. I've been thinking about about experimenting it. People seem to really enjoy it. What What were some of the biggest differences in your playing when you started using that? Well, I mean, Obviously, it, it's, it's not that it completely changes your playing immediately. Um, it, it comes step by, step by step. One of the, the most funny things that I found out that because of using this end pin, because, you know, I, I use it on my bass, but you have to drill a hole. So 90% basses you find other basses that you play with. If I'm using for other gigs or, or projects or playing in orchestra, they will have just a normal straight end pin. So we still have to play on them in a way like you used before. But having the experience with the Labarie and Pin actually changed my approach to the straight one too, in some ways. 
I just find that some things are physically easier with that angle. Well, first of all, because the base is put in a more f sort of friendly angle to your, or maybe physically natural angle to your bow arm. And I think still it doesn't matter if you play the underhand or overhand bow. Uh, it's just more natural weight on strings without overusing any muscular force. It's just very natural for your back, getting to a high register of, of the instrument. And also, it opens actually sound of the instrument. And b b because by putting the hole, which is not in the center of, of the instrument, but on the back, you uh, change the gravity. You, or you move the, the center of gravity of the instrument, so it becomes actually... I don't know if you've ever had a chance to hold an instrument with... I, I have, but I've never done more than like 10, 15 minutes of playing on one, so I haven't, I haven't really sunk into that setup. But have you ever... Um, that's, that's, that's good. If you, if you ever had a chance to compare the same bass, putting a straight end pin, and then playing the same bass right after that with the, with the Labori end pin, you would probably realize that the bass gets strangely light. Okay. It's almost swinging or swimming. Like you, it's very difficult actually to balance in the, in, in the beginning when you're not used to because the bass sort of escapes from you. Yeah. That's, that's what I've noticed with when people come and I try someone's bass. I always worry I'm going to drop it on the ground. That's right. So that's, so that, that's the strange thing. That's why it's, it's, it's actually not so easy. And I think even Francois said that you should start, if you've never done it, you should start by 10 minutes per day. I actually played, um, when I bought my Kenwala, I first used a very normal straight end pin, but then I was using for, for a year at least, I was using the bent end pin, but the steel end pin just put into the pack. Mm. But then uh, in this 45 degrees angle, which was a kind of, a, you could say, a, a bridge for me between coming from a very straight end pin to the Labori end pin. So I had a kind of a bit of the feeling of how it feels already. Um, so when I started with using the Rabat and Ping, I didn't actually switch back between straight and because the difference was just too big. And so I learned step by step. It wasn't easy in the beginning, but the, the benefits of the sound already, the resonance of the instrument and the, the, the fact that accessibility around registers on the instrument is just... And I think the bass just sounded the best with the Ping, so I would just carry on, you know? Uh, yeah. I love how you're describing how coming back to a, a bass with a straight end pin, you kind of, it's changed the way that you, you understand kind of how you've learned things about holding the bass. And that's so cool. I've noticed that myself with like, when I, I'm primarily a French bow player, but when I play some German bow, I come back to French bow and I'm thinking about it in a different way. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, I heard that. I, I should, you know, I, I, I say for years that I have to actually pick up and take some lessons from some good French bow player at least for teaching purposes. And I, I've, I've been saying this for years and I'm just so lazy because I've never done it. I, it's just non, non, non-reformable. He's just playing German bow all the time. <laughs> never <laughs> switch. I mean, it, it, w it would be actually because I love doing, uh, I love teaching and uh, every once in a while, majority of students that I get to teach at master classes or, or other places, they pl play German bows, but Occasionally, there are people with, with with French bows, and then once you have to show something to them, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I'll, every once in a while, I'll have a weirdly good German bow day. I'll play on a German, and I'll think, "Oh, I'm all right." And then, but ninety percent of the time, I pick it up, and I, I I can barely do anything. I have to hold it French bow style. Yeah. What's where? Where are you going to be? Th like the next six to twelve months? Where? What are some of the what projects you have coming up? Where are you going to be playing? What What are oh. you up to? Am I planning that much in advance? <laughs> or the next six weeks? Let's say I don't want to. <laughs> right, now, right now, I'm here in Amsterdam, uh, where I'm staying all of that month. Uh, I'm just in the middle of a big project with Amsterdam Sinfonietta, which is a tour. We just we've just been to Italy. To concerts in Bologna and Rome, and uh, the rest of concerts is here in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, and some other places. There's a little CD recording also. And right after that, I'm playing just as a guest a couple of pieces at a big cello festival, Cello Biennale, here in, in Amsterdam. And this, so this all will take time until the end of this month. And um, well, next year, well, I, I really hope to come to the ISB, of course in June, in Ithaca. There are some, some odd occasional chamber projects 
um, some teaching, I guess. I don't have that many firm plans, but I hope that uh, the next year will bring a lot of interesting projects as always. Yeah, well, it sounds like it's been it, it, ever since you struck out on this freelance path. It seems like you're it's got all sorts of interesting projects and you're bringing new pieces to light and this wonderful recording and these recitals. So I'm excited to follow along with your your career. It's You're doing great things. Well, thank you. And I, I want to say, uh, Jason, uh, before we met in Prague, I actually, I've known about you and your, your uh, Double Bass blog and the Contrabass Conversations site that I, I visited several times and I, I heard a few interviews, but just looking at the amount of different musicians and the variety of their styles and where, the, where they come from and the way they play and, and you all um, explore them and it, it's it's such a great thing you know because because it, it's also unifying for us for bass players you can go on the website and check out some players you've never heard about and 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 at least by you presenting them in your in your podcast you can just have an idea of oh, there's this guy playing this music or playing this style so it's great thank you for doing that well fe- fe- I, I appreciate you saying that it's great it's fun for me because like I this is the sort of conversation I'd love to be having over a coffee or a beer somewhere anyway you know this is like what I would la- want to be doing with my time anyway and to just be able to put it out in the world is so interesting and I get these emails that I just love I got one from a guy who's been working a job in Kazakhstan and he's listening to bass podcasts in Kazakhstan and I sort of forget that this stuff gets out here you know I'm just sitting in my apartment in San Francisco doing these and I know theoretically they get out to the world but it's just so cool like he, you and I are talking thousands of miles across the country right now it's like we're in the same room and yeah so it's it's fun but I, I hey you've got a lot of career ahead of you still let's do a round two sometime I'd love it if you came back on the show well uh, it, it would be great and thanks really thanks for having me Jason <laughs> Simone, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. And definitely round two for sure coming up in the future. So a little more listener feedback this week. Eric Nachtraub wrote in from Detroit. He's a jazz bassist, father of two in the Detroit area, plays wedding bands, classical bass is his hobby. And he says, when I have any extra time to practice, it's long tones with the bow and hacking away at the third cello suite, which is a worthy pursuit for sure. He says, I just wanted to say thanks for the podcast and all that you do. I really get a lot of inspiration from these interviews, particularly some of the recent ones. Matthew McDonald was great. I watched him play the Bob Zini, and he made me rethink my bow hold. Well, that's super cool. And I picked up Jory Herman's recording of the first three cello suites. I'm so happy to hear him play the third suite in G. <laughs> good luck in San Francisco and keep up the good work. And then Eric also wrote in after he heard the Frank Proto episode. He said, wow, Jason, I really love your show, but this Frank Proto interview, wow, just wow. I could listen to him talk all day. And I could too. And there's another round two coming up. For sure. Frank was so much fun to talk, and I feel like we barely scratched the surface. That's what's so fun for me about doing a show like this is it's not a one-and-done deal with people like this. You know, talking with Simone, he's a young guy. He's going to be doing a lot. What, what's he going to be doing in five years and 10 years and 20 years? And with my list of 400 people, I could do one of these every single day and never run out of people and probably never talk to someone again, but it's so great to talk to people again. I love sitting down for round twos. I'm headed down to LA in a couple weeks to do a round two with David Allen Moore. Really excited for that and more of that in the future. So thank you, Eric, for writing in. Super cool. And if you'd like to write in and say hi or offer up a suggestion for a guest or you got something coming up, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com will get your message to me. Facebook, Twitter, whatever, it'll come to me, and I'd love to hear from you. Nick Skelton wrote in. He says, I'm an adult enthusiast who, enthusiast, come on, Jason, who by nature of my job spends long periods away from my base. I'm enjoying the revival in a 
activity on the podcast as it keeps me connected with all things base for at least a short time. Revival and activity. That's a good way to put it. I have definitely revived the activity with these multiple weekly episodes. I used to, this is Nick again. I used to listen to the early episodes on my iPod while on a one hour commute between the hotel and the job site in the mornings through the countryside of central Java in Indonesia. For this reason, I still associate the podcast with the mango and rice cultivation I would pass through. Think mango groves and rice paddies. That's awesome. I, that is a great image. I would refill the iPod with episodes on the occasional trips to areas with decent web connections. Haven't we all been there? This is Jason speaking in. I remember in Door County, Wisconsin, I would go to the public library and I'd just pull my car up as close as I could to the library. And then I'd pull out my clunky laptop and I'd hook up my iPod and I'd download the podcast to my laptop and then I'd sync to my iPod and then I had to correctly eject the iPod. And with the rise in the area of smartphones and connected cars and we're just living in a different world but nick i totally i'm totally there with you so nick goes on this time around the current iteration of the podcast mostly from my ipad with the much more elegant ios app these get listened to in my bunk at the end of the day on an installation in kazakhstan kazakhstan so we've got central java indonesia and kazakhstan I, how cool is that? Again, I sometimes sort of forget that these episodes are listened to by many, many people. And I'm just sitting here. This is a Friday morning in San Francisco that I'm recording this. And how cool is that? The Kazakhstan and central Java. Um, then he gives me a couple suggestions, a couple hometown Houston heroes to consider for the podcast. David Craig jazz bassist and thomas helton all round bassist champion of new music and now luthier best regards from somewhere on the planet nick skelton love it <laughs> that's great nick thank you so much for writing it uh, that is just so cool I need to start a list of most exotic places that this podcast is listened to because that would definitely be at the top of the list again thank you for writing in it's so thrilling that you're listening to this. It's such an honor to get feedback from people, to take time of your busy day and write in. Podcast hosts always complain about, it's like you're screaming into a void and you feel like nobody ever reaches out to you. I, I don't feel like that. I feel like I get a lot of feedback and I'm so appreciative of it. And it helps me. The, the, all the guests you're hearing these days are from you. People suggesting, oh, you should talk to this person. Oh, you should talk to this person. Like one out of every 20 or 30 guesses, is my own brilliant idea. It's all from the community. This is a community affair. This is a community podcast. So thanks for tuning in. And thank you to Dario for sponsoring the podcast. It's these sponsorships that make it possible for me to take the time to talk with these people and schedule the interviews and edit the podcast and all the things that go in that I won't bore you with on the back end. But there's a lot of back end for doing a podcast. But thanks again. And we'll be back real soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.